Good afternoon, uh, and welcome to the campus conversation. This is the fourth uh, campus conversation uh, of this academic year. As many of you know, the goal of the campus conversation series is to have faculty, students, and staff engage with each other about some of the big issues of our time going on now and affecting all of us. As a community dedicated to social justice and diversity, we come together to try to understand current events and talk about issues. Today's conversation will be followed next month on March 5th by a lecture by Dean Erwin Chemerinsky of the UC Berkeley Law School about free speech on campus. Uh, and in April, the speaker will be Jonathan Metzl from Vanderbilt University, who will talk about race and health disparities. Today, we are honored to have Dr. Martha Nussbaum with us from the University of Chicago. Dr. Nussbaum will speak for about 40 minutes. Following that, she will be engaged in a conversation with Dr. Jennifer Breyer, who holds a joint appointment in Gender and Women's Studies and History at UIC, and Professor Roderick Ferguson, who is a professor in the Departments of Gender and Women's Studies and African American Studies also at UIC. We will follow that by a Q&A session. Paper has been provided so that you can write down your questions, and they will be um, collected uh, during the talk. Um, if you are a student, and you have a question, please put an S at the top of your piece of paper. Uh, Dr. Nussbaum uh, would like to uh, have time at least to answer uh, a few student questions before she goes on to other questions. Um, so we will collect all of these and utilize them during the Q&A session, and we will adjourn uh, at about uh, 1.50. So it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Martha Nussbaum. I am doing an extremely abbreviated introduction to save time. So I will not do justice to the scope and brilliance of Dr. Nussbaum's career and her position as one of the great public intellectuals of our time. Dr. Nussbaum is the Ernst Freund Distinguished Service Professor of Law and Ethics appointed in the Law School and Philosophy Department at the University of Chicago. She's an associate in the Classics Department, the Divinity School, and the Political Science Department a member of the Committee on Southern Asian Studies, and a board member of the Human Rights Program. Martha Nussbaum received her BA from NYU and her MA and PhD from Harvard. She has taught at Harvard University, Brown University, and Oxford University. She has received honorary degrees from 60 colleges and universities in the US, Canada, Latin America, Asia, Africa, and Europe. She is an academician, academician in the Academy of Finland, a fellow of the British Academy and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Society. Among her many, many awards are the Centennial Medal of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at Harvard University, the Kyoto Prize in Arts and Philosophy, and the Don M. Randall Prize for Achievement in the Humanities from the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She is the author of many, many books as well. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Martha Nussbaum to present a lecture on anger, fear, and the politics of blame. OK, thank you so much. And I want to thank the two commentators for taking time to, to be here. Uh, I'm going to begin with a Greek tragedy, uh, because as you'll see, I think it sets up the problems that unfortunately are still with us in our equally uh, troubled democracy. So at the end of the Oresteia of Aeschylus, which was in the fifth century BC, two transformations take place in the city of Athens. One is famous, the other often neglected. In the famous transformation, the goddess Athena introduces legal institutions to replace and terminate the seemingly endless cycle of blood vengeance. Setting up a court of law with established procedures of evidence and argument and a jury chosen by lot from all the citizens of Athens, she now announces that blood guilt will be settled by law rather than by the furies, those ancient goddesses of revenge. But the furies are not entirely dismissed. Instead, Athena gives them a place of honor beneath the earth in recognition of their importance for the health of the city and these same legal institutions. Typically, this move of Athena's is understood to be a recognition that the legal system in a democracy must incorporate and honor the retributive passions. These passions themselves remain unchanged 
They simply have a new house built around them. So the Furies agree to accept the constraints of law, but they retain a nature that is dark and vindictive. That reading, however, ignores the second transformation, which is a transformation in the nature and demeanor of the Furies themselves. As the drama begins, the Furies are described as repulsive and horrifying. They're said to be black, disgusting. Their eyes are said to drip a hideous liquid. Actually, as a young actress, I had to play one of these, so it was quite challenging. Um, Apollo even says that they're vomiting up clots of blood that they've ingested from their prey. They belong, he says, in some barbarian tyranny where cruelty reigns. Nor when they awaken do the Furies give the lie to these grim descriptions. As the ghost of the murdered Clytemnestra calls them, they don't even speak. They simply make animal noises. When they do begin to speak, of course in a play you have to at some point speak, their only words at first are, get him, get him, get him, get him, get him, as close to a predator's hunting cry as the genre allows. As Clytemnestra says, in your dream, you pursue your prey, and you bark like a hunting dog hot on the trail of blood. If the Furies are later given poetic speech, as of course they've got to do, we're never supposed to forget this initial characterization. What Aeschylus has done is to depict unbridled retributive anger. It is obsessive, destructive, existing only to inflict pain and ill. As the 18th century philosopher Bishop Butler observes, no other principle or passion hath for its end the misery of our fellow creatures. So Apollo's idea is that this emotion belongs somewhere else, surely not in a law-abiding democracy. So unchanged, these furies could not be at the foundation of a society committed to the rule of law. You don't put wild dogs in a cage and come out with justice. But the Furies do not, in fact, make the transition to democracy unchanged. Until quite late in the drama, they are still their bestial selves, threatening to disgorge their venom on the land. But then Athena persuades them to alter themselves so as to join her enterprise, lull to repose the bitter force of your black wave of anger, she tells them. But of course, that really means a change of identity. So bound up are they with anger's obsessive force. She offers them some incentives to join the democracy, but only on condition that they adopt a new range of sentiments, substituting future-directed benevolence for backward-looking retribution. Perhaps most fundamental of all, they must listen to the voice of persuasion. They accept her offer, and they say that from now on, they're going to express themselves with gentle tempered intent. Each, they declare, should give generously to each in what they call a mindset of common love. Not surprisingly, they're transformed physically in related ways. They don't crouch anywhere. They assume an erect posture for the parade that concludes the drama. And they are given robes by a group of citizen escorts. So they've become Athenian women rather than beasts. Their very name is changed. They're now the Eumenides, the kindly ones, and not the Furies. Aeschylus is trying to show, I think, that a democratic legal order can't just put a cage around retribution. It needs, if it's going to survive, to fundamentally transform it from something obsessive, bloodthirsty, to something fully human accepting of reasons, something determined to protect life rather than threatening it. They still have to deal with crime, but they're not wanted or needed in their original retributive form. They must become instruments of justice and future-directed human welfare. Like modern democracies, like ours, the ancient Greek democracy had an anger problem. If you read the historians, you see some things that are not unfamiliar. Individuals litigating obsessively against people that they think have wronged them. Groups blaming other groups for their relative lack of power. 
citizens blaming prominent politicians and other elites for selling out the dearest values of the democracy, other groups blaming foreign visitors or even women for their own political and personal woes. The anger that the Greeks and later the Romans, very similarly, knew all too well was an anger full of fear at one's own human vulnerability. The Roman philosopher Lucretius in the first century BC even says that all political anger is an outgrowth of fear, of the terror of each human baby who comes into the world helpless and like all the other animals, can't do anything at all to ensure its own survival. Lucretius then says that as life goes on, vulnerability continues and in a way increases since the knowledge that we're gonna die hits us hard at some point and that makes us realize that we are in fact helpless with respect to the most important thing of all. This fear, he says, makes everything worse, leading to political ills that we'll talk about in a minute. But for now, let's focus on anger. So the Greeks and Romans saw a lot of anger around them. But as classical scholar William Harris shows in a fine book called Restraining Rage, they did not embrace or valorize anger. They did not define manliness in terms of anger. And indeed, as with those furies, they tended to impute it to females whom they saw as childlike and immature. However much they felt and expressed anger, they waged a cultural struggle against it, seeing it as destructive of human well-being and democratic institutions. The first word of Homer's great epic Iliad is anger. The anger of Achilles that, quote, brought thousandfold pains upon the Achaeans. And the Iliad's hopeful ending requires Achilles to give up his anger and to be reconciled with his enemy Priam as both acknowledge the frailty of human life. I believe the Greeks and Romans are right. Anger is a poison to democratic politics and it's all the worse when fueled by a lurking fear and sense of helplessness. But that idea is radical and evokes strong opposition. For anger, with all its ugliness, is a very popular emotion in America today. Many people think it's impossible to care for justice without anger at injustice, and that anger should therefore be encouraged as part of a social transformation. Many people also believe that it's impossible for individuals to stand up for their own self-respect and that of others without anger that someone who reacts to wrongs and insults without anger is spineless and downtrodden. Nor are these ideas confined to the sphere of personal relations. The most popular position today in the sphere of criminal justice is what's known as retributivism, namely the view that the law ought to punish aggressors in a manner that embodies the spirit of retributive anger. And it's also very widely believed that successful challenges against social injustice need anger to make progress. Still, we may persist briefly in our Aeschylean skepticism, remembering that recent years have seen three noble and successful freedom movements, all conducted in the spirit of non-anger. Those of Mohandas Gandhi, of Martin Luther King Jr., and of Nelson Mandela. Surely, people who stood up for their own self-respect and that of others, and who did not acquiesce in injustice. And I'll, of the three, I'm only gonna talk about King today. But I'll now argue that a philosophical analysis of anger can help us support these philosophies of non-anger, showing why anger is fatally flawed from a normative viewpoint, especially poisonous, too, when people use it to deflect attention from real problems that they feel powerless to solve. So there are gonna be now four sections and I'll just tell you when each one is starting. Section one, the roots of anger, rage, ideas of unfairness. So let's now return briefly to that baby whom Lucretius describes. So babies at birth don't have anger as such because anger requires causal thinking. Someone did something bad to me. Fairly soon, however, that idea creeps in. 
those caretakers are not giving me what I desperately need. They did this to me. It's because of them that I'm cold, wet, and hungry. Experiences of being fed, held, and comforted quickly lead to expectations, expectations to demands. Instinctual self-love makes us value our own survival and comfort, but the self is threatened by others when they don't do what we need and expect. Psychoanalyst Melanie Klein refers to this emotional reaction in, in infants as persecutory anxiety, since it is indeed fear, but fear coupled with an idea of a vague threat coming from outside. So I'd rather use ordinary language and call it fear, anger, or even fear, blame. If we were not helpless, we would just go get what we need. But since we are initially helpless, we have to rely on others. They don't always give us what we need, and then we lash out, blaming them. Blame gives us a strategy. Now I'll enforce my will by yelling and making a lot of noise. But it also expresses an underlying picture of the world. The world ought to give us what we demand. When people don't do that, they're bad. So hold on to that idea, because I'm going to come back to that later. Protest and blame are positive in a sense. They construct a purposive universe in which I'm an agent, making demands. My life is valuable. Things ought to be arranged so that I'm happy and my needs are met. But retributive anger all too often infects the thought of blame and even the idea of punishment. The people who haven't done what we want ought to suffer for what they have done or failed to do. Psychologist Paul Bloom has shown that retributive thinking appears very early in the lives of infants, even before they begin to use language. Infants show pleasure when they see the so-called bad person who's in, in the experiment is a puppet who has snatched something away from another puppet when they see that one get beaten with a stick. Well, Bloom calls this an early sense of justice. I would prefer to call it the internal furies that inhabit us all and that are not securely linked to real justice. The infant's idea looks like a variant of what usually is called the lex talionis, an eye for an eye, pain for pain. And it's not hard to imagine that that crude idea of proportional payback has an early and maybe even an evolutionary origin. It's a leap to call this an idea of justice and I think we should not make that leap. But now to section two, defining anger. So let's now fast forward to human adulthood. People now experience and express not just primitive anger, but full-fledged anger. Okay, but what is that? Philosophers are fond of definitions which are very good for clearing our heads. In this case, helping us to separate the potentially problematic aspects of anger from the parts that cause nothing but trouble. And back to the Greeks, let's talk about Aristotle's definition, because more or less all the definitions of anger in the Western philosophical tradition are modeled on it. And those in Indian traditions, which unfortunately is the only non-Western tradition I know much about, are very, very similar. Okay, so according to Aristotle, anger is a response to a significant damage to something or someone that one cares about and a damage that the angry person believes to have been wrongfully inflicted. Aristotle adds that although the anger itself is painful, it also contains within itself a pleasant hope for payback or retribution. So we have significant damage pertaining to what one cares about and wrongfulness those two elements seem both true and pretty uncontroversial, and they've been validated by modern psychological studies. Those parts of anger can go wrong in specific and local ways. We might be wrong about who did the bad thing or how important it was or whether it was really done wrongfully rather than just accidentally. But they are often on target. More controversial, perhaps, is the idea that angry people usually want some type of retribution and that this is a conceptual part of what anger itself is. All the Western philosophers who define anger 
do include that wish for retribution as a conceptual element in anger. But we better pause because that's not obvious. Now we should understand that this wish for retribution can be a very subtle wish. I don't need to wish to go out and take the revenge myself. I might just want the law to do that for me or maybe even some type of divine justice. Or maybe even more subtly, the person may simply wish the wrongdoer's life to go very badly in the future, hoping, for example, that that second marriage of your betraying spouse is a dismal failure. I think if we understand the wish in this broad way, Aristotle's right. Anger typically does contain a kind of strike back tendency, and that's what differentiates it from other painful emotions like compassion and grief. Contemporary psychologists agree. But we should understand that those two parts of anger can come apart. We can feel outrage at the wrongfulness of an act or an unjust state of affairs without wanting payback for the wrong done to us. So I'm going to be arguing that the outrage part is personally and socially valuable when our beliefs are correct. We need to recognize wrongful acts and protest them. And there is one species of anger, I believe, that is free of the retributive wish. Its entire content is how outrageous that is. Something must be done about that. Now, I call this, I just make up a technical term for it, I call it transition anger because it expresses a protest, but it turns around to face forward. It gets to work finding solutions rather than dwelling on the infliction of retrospective pain. Take parents and children. Now, of course, parents often feel that children have acted wrongfully and they're outraged. They want to protest the wrong, somehow to hold the child accountable. But usually, parents avoid retributive payback. They rarely think, at least today, now you've got to suffer for what you've done, as if that by itself was a fitting response. Instead, they ask themselves what kind of reaction will be firm enough to get the child's attention, and then they go on to think, what can we do about the future to improve the child going forward? And of course, usually the response will not be a painful payback, and it certainly will not obey the lex talionis, an eye for an eye. So loving parents typically have the outrage part of anger without the payback part, where their own children are concerned because they love them and they want them to do well. This will be a clue to my positive proposal for a democratic society where I fear that we do not always love our fellow citizens. Retributive wishes, however, are a deep part of human nature, fostered by some parts of the major religions and by many societal cultures, although they have also been denounced by religious and social radicals from Jesus and the Buddha to Mohandas Gandhi. They may have served us well in a pre-social condition deterring aggression, but the idea that pain is made good or assuaged by more pain, though extremely common, is a deceptive fiction. Killing the killer does, do not, does not restore the dead to life, much though the demand for capital punishment is endorsed by many families of victims as if it did somehow set the world to rights. Pain for pain is an easy idea, but it's a false lure, creating more pain instead of rectifying the problem. As Gandhi said, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. This wish for payback arises in all kinds of situations. Take divorce again. Betrayed spouses often feel entitled to seek punitive divorce settlements and child custody arrangements as if that somehow would somehow improve the situation going forward and restore the balance of power. But in real life, the function of payback is usually far less benign. Two people become locked in a struggle for pain focused on the past and often inflicting great collateral damage on children and friends and family. In the end, the betrayer may get what's usually called his comeuppance, but what does that achieve? Typically, it does not improve the litigant's life going forward, 
By focusing obsessively on the past, she often becomes closed to new possibilities, and she often becomes bitter and unpleasant. Retaliation is ugly, as Aeschylus shows in his portrait of the Furies. What the payback seeker wants is future happiness and self-respect. Payback by itself never gets you that, and it usually makes the world a lot worse for all. But wait a minute. We all agree that wrongful acts, if they are serious enough, should be punished, and punishment is typically painful. Yes, I think we should agree that punishment is often useful, but then the question is why and how. We might see punishment in a retributive spirit as payback for what has already happened. That's the attitude that I've been criticizing, and it does great social harm, leading in our country to a gruesome pile on the misery strategy of mass incarceration, as if that really compensated for the damages of crime. But there's a better attitude, more like that of the good parent in my example. We might look to the future and try to produce a better society, using punishment when we do to express the value we attach to human life and safety, to deter other people from committing that crime, and we hope to deter that same person from committing another crime. But if we think this way, trying to improve the future, we probably will have a lot of other thoughts before we get to the thought of punishment. Like that good parent, we will notice that people don't do wrong nearly as often if they are basically loved and respected, if they have enough to eat, if they get good medical care, if they get a decent education, if they see a future of employment opportunities. So thinking about crime should lead us to think more broadly, to design a society in which people have many fewer incentives to commit crime. When they do, despite our best efforts, if we really would make them, then we would take that seriously for the sake of the future. Now, then we go forward and point to another problem with anger. And I've got to uh, just focus on one of the further problems. There are several, uh, which is back to this idea of the orderly world. We impute blame often, even when we're not sure where the blame should go. The world is full of accidents and complicated events. Sometimes a disaster is just a disaster. Sometimes illness and hardship are just illness and hardship. And sometimes, as with economic calamities, this source is very obscure and hard to pinpoint. But in our monarchical way, we expect the world to be made for our service. It gratifies people's ego and is, in a deep sense, comforting to think that any bad event is some person's fault and that we can identify that person and punish that person. That's what the kids in, in Bloom's experiments are doing. So the act of pinning blame and pursuing the bad guy is deeply consoling. It makes us feel control rather than helplessness. Psychologists have done a lot of research on people's instinctual views of the world, and they call this the just world hypothesis. They say, you know, people do assume this, and then they try to blame whoever messed that up. So let's say your parent dies in the hospital. It's very human to believe somebody did that, the doctors did that, and to deflect grief into malpractice litigation. Economic woes are sometimes caused by an identifiable person or person's wrongdoing, and sometimes by clearly stupid or unfair policies, but more often their cause is uncertain. We feel bad saying that. It makes the world look messy and ungovernable. So when we see things like automation, outsourcing that are making a mess of people's lives, why not pin the blame, as the Greeks did, on groups that are easy to demonize? In place of their rhetorical category of barbarians, we might focus blame on immigrants or women entering the wor workplace and so on. The Salem witch trials were once thought to be the result of group hysteria among teenage girls. But now we know that a preponderant number of the witch blamers were actually young men 
entering adulthood, afflicted by the usual woes of an insecure colony in a new world, economic uncertainty, a harsh climate, political instability. How easy then to blame the whole thing on witches, usually elderly, unpopular women who can easily be targeted and whose death brings a temporary satisfaction to the mind. A lot of our earliest fairy tales have this same structure. Hansel and Gretel wander into the woods to search for food. The problem in this story is hunger, compounded by the fact that their parents have to work at menial jobs and have no time to care for the children. But the story tells us, oh no, these very real problems are unreal. And the real problem is a witch who lives in the woods, who likes to turn little children into gingerbread. So you just push the witch into the oven and the world is all right again. Red Riding Hood goes to visit her grandmother, walking a long way in the woods alone. The real problem in that story is aging and lack of care. Grandmother lives far away and she's not doing well. And that problem requires a structural solution. But no, in the story we're told it's not that problem. It's a single wolf who was broken into grandmother's house. In both stories, when the ugly villain is killed, the world is just fine. Our love of an orderly universe makes these simple fictional solutions tempting. It's hard to wrap our minds around complicated truths, and it's far easier to incinerate the witch than to live with hope in a world that is not made to assuage our fears. So now the last section four, protest without payback. So what's the alternative? It is, I think, that we can keep the spirit of determined protest against injustice while letting go of the empty fantasy of payback. This forward-looking strategy includes protesting wrongdoing when it occurs, but not imputing wrongdoing where there is instead the murky thicket of the global economy to manage, outsourcing and automation to reconcile with our fellow citizens' welfare. So to conclude, I want to study just one example of protest without payback, the ideas on this subject of Martin Luther King Jr., who certainly contributed a great deal, as you know, to our society, but I want to show you that, that he was also a major philosopher and thinker about these issues. Uh, now, King always said that anger had a limited usefulness in that it brought people into his movement rather than just sitting at home in despair. But once they got there, he said repeatedly, something has to happen to their anger. And he used two words, purified and channelized. And I think it's clear from reading all the things he says on this, that people, what he meant was that people have to give up the payback wish and yet keep the spirit of justified protest. Instead of retribution, they need hope and faith in the possibility of justice. In an essay written in 1959, he says that the struggle for racial integration will continue to encounter obstacles, and that these obstacles can be met in two very different ways. So I'm gonna quote here. One is the development of a wholesome social organization to resist with effective firm measures any efforts to impede progress. The other is a confused anger-motivated drive to strike back violently to inflict damage. Primarily, it seeks to cause injury, to retaliate for wrongful suffering. It is punitive, not radical or constructive. I mean, very interesting that he says not radical because of course he, he does believe, and I think rightly, that it's hope that's radical and not, not the retribution which is all too familiar. So King, of course, was characterizing not just a deep-seated human tendency, but the actual uh, political ideas of Malcolm X, at least as he understood them. King insisted constantly that his approach did not mean acquiescing in injustice. There's still an urgent demand. There's still a protest against unjust conditions in which the protester takes great risks with his or her body in what King called direct action. Still, the protesters' future must turn to the future that all must work to create together. King, in short, favors and exemplifies what I called 
transition anger, the protest part of anger without the payback. But to see this better, let's briefly study the sequence of emotions in the famous I have a dream speech. So as you certainly know, King begins with what looks like a summons to anger. He points to the wrongful injuries of racism which have failed to fulfill the nation's implicit promises of equality. 100 years after Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, he says, quote, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. But then the next move King makes is highly significant. For instead of demonizing white Americans, he calmly compares them to people who have defaulted on a financial obligation. Quote, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check that has come back marked insufficient funds. So here begins the shift to what I've called transition anger, for it makes us think ahead in non-retributive ways. The essential question is not how whites can be destroyed, but how can this debt be paid? And in the financial metaphor, the thought of destroying the debtor is not likely to be central. The future now takes over as King focuses on a time in which all may join together pursuing justice and honoring obligations. But we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. No mention again of torment or payback, only of determination to ensure the protection of civil rights at last. Uh, so there's stuff in the middle where he explicitly repudiates wrongful deeds and angry outbursts. Uh, but now I'm gonna go toward the end, the famous part. The, part where I have a dream takes flight. Now, of course, this dream is not a dream of retributive punishment, although, of course, the book of Revelation could have been used in that direction. It is instead a prophetic dream of equality, liberty, and brotherhood. In pointed terms, King invites the African-American members of his audience and his movement to imagine brotherhood even with their former tormentors. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day, even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that one day, down in Alabama, with its vicious racists, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words interposition and nullification, one day, right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. There is indeed outrage in this speech and the outrage summons up a vision of rectification which could easily have taken a retributive form. But King gets to work right away, reshaping retributivism into work and hope. For how, sanely and really, could injustice be made good by retributive payback? The oppressor's pain and lowering do not make the afflicted free. Only an intelligent and imaginative effort toward justice can do that. It may seem strange to compare King to Aeschylus, but actually it's not strange at all given King's vast learning in literature and philosophy and his equal greatness as a creative thinker. He's basically saying the same thing. Democracy must give up the empty and destructive thought of payback and move toward a future of legal justice and human well-being. King's opponents portrayed that stance as weak. Malcolm X said sardonically that it was like some coffee that has had so much milk poured into it. It's gotten white and cold, doesn't even taste like coffee. But that was wrong. King's stance is strong, not weak. He resists the retributive impulse, one of the strongest and deepest human impulses for the sake of democracy and the future. 
one of the trickiest problems in politics is to persist in a determined search for solutions without letting our fears deflect us onto the track of anger's errors. The idea that Aeschylus and King share is that democratic citizens should face with courage the problems and yes, the outrageous injustices that we encounter in political and social life. Lashing out in anger and fear does not solve the problem. Instead, it leads, as it did in both Athens and Rome, to a spiral of retributive violence. So I'm just gonna end with one more classical example. Lucretius tells a grim tale of human anger and fear run wild. He imagines a world not unlike his own in which insecurity leads to acts of aggression which do not quiet the insecurity. So at the time when he wrote, the Roman Republic was imploding and Julius Caesar would soon take over. So, so everything was in flux. In order to quiet their fears, he imagines, people get more and more aggressive until they think up a new way to inflict the maximum damage on their enemies, putting wild beasts to work in the military. And here's how it goes. They even tried out bulls in the service of war. They practiced letting wild boars loose against their enemies. They even used fierce lions as an advance guard, equipped with a special force of armed and ferocious trainers to hold them in check and keep them in harness. It was no use. The lions, hot with blood, broke ranks wildly, trampled the troops, tossing their manes. In a poetic tour de force, Lucretius now goes on for about 20 more lines, describing the carnage the animals unleash. Then he pulls back and says, did this really happen? Maybe it happened in some other world out in space. And what, he says, did those fictional people really want to accomplish? They wanted to inflict great pain on their enemies, even if it meant that they would perish themselves. Lucretius's point, of course, is that our retributive emotions are these wild animals. People may think anger very powerful, but it always gets out of hand and turns back on us. And yet worse, half the time, people don't even care. They're so deeply sunk in payback fantasies that they prefer to accomplish nothing so long as they make those people suffer. His science fiction fantasy reminds us that we'll always defeat ourselves so long as we let ourselves be governed by fear, anger, and the politics of blame. There is a better alternative. Aeschylus knew it, and King both knew and lived it, and of course died for it. Making a future of justice and well-being is hard. It requires self-examination, personal risk, searching critical arguments, and uncertain initiatives to make common cause with opponents. In a spirit of hope and what we could call rational faith, it's a difficult goal, but it's that goal I'm recommending for both individuals and societies. Now, what we have to do is try to produce it. Thank you. All right, I think um, Ginny and I agree that I would start. Uh, first, I want to thank Professor Nussbaum for really engaging um, address and also set of provocations. Uh, part of the way in which I read this is your you know, interpretation of a kind of classical question around the relationship between rationality and irrationality. And part of what was so provocative and so interesting about um, the address today in terms of anger um, is the way in which it has a kind of, you know, 
conceptual importance both in philosophy and also in social movements. So one of the things I was wondering if you could do is to maybe just talk a bit about uh, the relationship between the terms, um, transition anger and retributive anger. Yeah. One, transition anger having to do with you know, an anger that transitions toward you know, a greater concern with social transformation, um, and then a retributive anger that has to do with um, you know, exactly what the category retribution suggests, vengeance, you know, violence. How do we mobilize one without activating the other? Yeah, well, thank you so much. First of all, I guess I want to emphasize that just the simple contrast between rationality and irrationality doesn't really help us because the emotions, as I believe all of them, but, but let's just focus on anger, have a conceptual content. So they're not irrational in the sense of having no thought at all. And then the question is, is this thought helpful or is it not so helpful? And uh, in this case, I think anger has one part anger as standardly defined and as most people use the word, of course different countries have different words and so on, um, it, it has something in it that's very right when our beliefs are correct, namely we recognize a wrongful act that's been done to something important that we care about and we say, you know, that, that's wrong, that shouldn't have happened. Now, of course, our particular beliefs might be wrong. We might have been mistaken about who did it, or we might be wrong about how important it is. Aristotle talks about getting angry when somebody forgets your name. You know, some of these things are uh, age old. But, but when the beliefs are right, that's very helpful for society, because then we have to fix it. But the trouble is the retributive part is so closely bound up with it, and it really is probably evolutionary, the way our minds work. We think, oh, so now I gotta clobber the, the, the person who did that. And that looks backward. It's not always wrong to look backward, but, but here, you know, killing the killer doesn't restore the dead to life, and, and people often think, does somehow. There's a kind of fantasy of cosmic justice. And so, you know, get, giving up on that doesn't mean you don't punish people, but then you have to think, why are you punishing them? What did you fail to do before they committed the crime? That, that to me is... And, and so, you know, giving up on retribution means, first of all, focusing on why do people commit crimes? Is it the fault of our whole society? Do we need to give better education, better housing? And so all those thoughts we're not even going to get on the table if we have this simple retributive paradigm. But if we have the forward-looking paradigm, then all of these useful thoughts come into view. But then what other emotions come into view? I think then, if we're going to do anything better and fix the bad thing that occurred, we do need hope. And we need to be motivated by hope rather than fear. Now, of course, it's very difficult. And then we have to ask ourselves, how do we get people to feel hope? Especially when things are bad, it, it's very hard. And why, why should they feel hope? Things are really bad. Um, now, I think actually hope and fear are, are quite similar because they both require significant uncertainty. <laughs> It's just a question of how you view, you know, is the glass half full or is it half empty? And, and so then why should you hope? I think here I would turn to Immanuel Kant. Kant says we have an obligation to cultivate hope in ourselves because we have an obligation to do good in society and to do good for others, but we won't do that if we don't have hope. And so we better get ourselves to have hope. So then at the very end of my book, I try to talk about how, how can people in Chicago try to work up hope. And I think it's very personal and it's very contextual, but there are lots of things. I, I do think that for many people, religion is a great source of hope. I think that for most of us, the arts are great schools of hope. I also think actually, that rational argument and debate are sources of hope because you know, it shows res a respectful dialogue with other people who disagree. So there are many things we could talk about here, but I think, and frankly, just joining a protest movement, working for a candidate, as so many people did in the recent midterm elections, I think that was a huge school of hope. I worked for Lauren Underwood and I, I did see so many people who were you know, previously, oh, you know, what, well, we can't change anything. But then the, the idea, yes, yes, we can change something. So there are all those things to talk about, yeah. Um, 
thank you very much, and it's uh, wonderful to have you here in a space where we can have this dialogue. Because for me, one of the emotions that is also sort of circling around is hatred. And I wonder, so you've talked about fear and you've talked about anger. I think hatred is a powerful emotion that um, animates mm, yeah. a great deal of political discourse. Um, and then there's the experience of different kinds of pain. And I wonder if it's worth sort of talking about what you see as the relationship um, between hatred and anger um, yeah. and how, uh, I guess also for me, the other question that has been circling in my mind as I was reading your work this weekend and then hearing you again today is really who, who and what can we attribute these emotions to? So there's a way in which there's a conversation about this at the individual level, and we can talk about what it means to um, channel our anger emotion into more transformative, or as you call it, transitional um, thinking. But then there's also the reality of like, does the state have emotion? Is it useful for us to think about the aid the state as a, an emotional or affective actor? And then, you know, what does that do for us and what does it not do for us? Yeah, both great questions. Hatred, I guess, you know, people use words in different ways, but roughly speaking, the thing about anger that's actually pretty promising is that it's directed usually at an act, not at the whole person. I get angry at what you did to me. Uh, no, of course I can say I'm angry at you, but it's usually ba basically focused on some specific act. And that is the way, of course, it's used in the criminal law because our criminal justice system, for all its flaws, is based on an actual criminal act. Um, so that's hopeful because you could think, well, okay, you did something bad, but maybe you're not irretrievably evil. And, and that is what King is urging us to do, to separate the doer from the deed, and that, that's something that Gandhi talks a great deal about too, that yeah, they did something bad, but then they're not irretrie irretrievably evil. But now let me move to the second question. Yeah, absolutely the state, and I want just to talk about the criminal justice system, can be an emotional actor. And when I say the dominant position in uh, the criminal justice in the US today is retributivism, I don't mean that it's full of ravening, you know, bestial people who all want to, you know, get him, get him, get him. But I mean that the ideas of punishment that inhabit our legal tradition are largely retributive in spirit. And so people are brought up to believe that the state should punish in that manner. Now, of course, it's, uh, it was con contradicted by the utilitarians in the 18th century, but the retributive paradigm is dominant. And now there, there's a change, but not so much in the US, toward a kind of restorative justice I was in New Zealand for a while last year and observed a very fine judge who's also writing a book on this topic, sentencing actual offenders. And what he always did in every case is said, well, this is why what you did was very bad. But he says, and I don't believe that you are bad. So let's see what we can do to fix your life going forward. And in New Zealand, a lot of the offenders, oh, sorry, that's yours, I guess. A lot of the offenders are, um, no, I guess that is mine. Are, are, are young um, Maori or Samoans who are new to alcohol and then they get hooked on alcohol for a while and they bash up somebody's car or they commit a burglary or something. And, and so these were minor crimes of young people with a great possibility. Well, you could lock them up and throw away the key. You could channel hatred in their direction. Let me say some more about that in a minute. Um, but, but instead, the, the whole system, and it's built into the instructions for judges, uh, it encourages them to think how the punishment, the sentence that's given, could improve the person's life going forward. Such as 
you know, not sentencing them to a long jail term if they have a gainful job and the crime is minor. And so, so all of that stuff I think we need to learn much more about. And we're, ironically, we're starting to with the opioid crisis because all the offenders are white. So people immediately think, oh, let's fix their lives, right? And now we're talking about treatment and not about punishment. Uh, hatred, by contrast, I think is directed at the whole person. That is, you just want that person to go, their, you want their life to go badly. Aristotle even says hatred means you want them to disappear. Uh, and I think that's basically right. So, so that would be very, very dangerous in society because it's incompatible with this forward-looking thought about how can their lives be made better. And when you have hatred, of course it spreads to anyone who shares similar characteristics. And then you're not going to want to think about how can they have better housing? How can they have better nutrition? Because you just want them to disappear. And I think that's the problem with hatred in our society. Okay, maybe staying with this, um, I wonder if you can say a bit about the normalization of retributive anger and the role of the state. Because it seems so much of you know, why and how people are encouraged to adopt the retributive aspects of anger is because there is a state that legitimately um, punishes, that um, can you know, discern between you know, rational anger, violence, irrational mm -hmm. anger, you know, violence. It is the state and the courts that bring closure you know, to a case. I mean, you use an interesting phrase a couple of times, bringing the dead back to life. And yeah. somehow we attribute the state with this sort of magical, mystical ability to bring the dead back to life if there is justice as the state defines it. So I wonder if you might talk about the, the normalization of uh, that aspect of anger and also the state's implication in that. Yeah, well, as I think, the roots of this idea are evolutionary, so you have to work against it. And it's an uphill struggle. And the Greeks and Romans were constantly working against it, but they didn't really get rid of it. So you'll see people writing letters back and forth. Cicero's brother, Quintus, is governor out in Syria. And Cicero says, I hear some quite good things about you, but there's one great flaw you have. You get angry and you're too punitive and so So that's the kind of discourse that society had, but they still had the problem. But our society encourages from the very get-go the idea that anger is manly. And there's a lot of, 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 of psychological work on gender differentiation where they show that the very same baby who's crying is labeled as fearful if it's a girl, if the person thinks it's a girl, they'll say, you know, the experimenter will say, will you hold her for me? And then the subject says, oh, poor thing, she is very upset. Uh, but if the baby is labeled as male, they tend to label the emotion as anger and think of it as good. Oh, he's really angry, he wants to get what he wants, and the baby is bounced in the air. So, you know, in sports and in lots of other places, manly anger is strongly encouraged. And, uh, I mean, sports I could go on and on about, but because I am a sports fan, but I think it's a very great source of retributive spirit in American society. Uh, so then, what about the criminal justice system? How did it get there? Well, it got there partly because it's deeply ingrained in human beings, partly because the dominant version of both Christianity and Judaism endorsed it, although, as I say, in Jesus it was quite a different thing, and, uh, and, and, and there were always other views around. And so, you know, the idea would be, you assume the role of God for the time being, and you just destroy the offender in the way that an angry God would be imagined to do. As if, of course, you had the right to play God in that context, but judges usually do think they have that, that right. Uh, so, you know, the utilitarians who tried to counteract this and to say, what on earth good does this do? How can we have a better society? We're branded as um, weak, insensitive, and so on. And uh, it's been a struggle. It's, it's always been a struggle. And I think, uh, you know, in our society, what, what makes it a particular struggle, where we do see other societies turning away from the retributive paradigm, is that is, is racial hatred and other kinds of hatred, where we have certain people 
that we don't regard as really worthy of respect, where the dominant group thinks, well, let's just lock them up. And it's fueled partly by fear and various kinds of unsavory imaginings of the minority as predators and so very similar things if you study South Africa under apartheid very similar emotional constellations fuel the rise in retributive and punitive justice there and of course the the antidote is to think about criminal justice differently but there too it was it faced great opposition Alan Payton the novelist whose cry the beloved country I think is one of the great great novels about punishment. It's about two fathers, one the father of the victim and one the father of the killer, one black, one white, and so on. And uh, they give up retributivism. But the society, of course, does not. And it shows you, and Peyton was a juvenile justice reformer, but he was fired from his job because he didn't lock them up. He tried to reform them. And so then he became a novelist. And so, so anyway, this is, you know, it's very, very hard to change this when people are frightened. Now, to take one example of how it's gotten worse, we used to think that at the penalty phase of a criminal trial, the person who gets extra time to speak is the defendant, and that the whole purpose of the penalty phase is to put on the table new evidence of hardships that you have faced in pleading for mitigation of sentence. That is part of our constitutional law. 1976 case says the defendants have an irretrievable and inexorable right to plead for mercy at the penalty phase. However, recently, and starting around 20 years ago, the demand for victim impact statements in criminal trials has been ramped up and up. And when that first began in around, oh, I think about late 1990s, there was one, very, and I think scholars have played a role in this, and I, I won't name the ones who are behind this movement, but they certainly have convinced the public very powerfully. But there's one very courageous scholar right here in Chicago, Susan Bandy's at DePaul Law School. She wrote again and again fine articles showing that victim impact statements are deleterious for various reasons. First of all, they are unequal between victims because some of them have outraged families and others don't, but also because it gives the jury who's likely to be more similar to the victim in race and in class. It gives the jury someone to bond with that will distract them from their appropriate attention to the defendant. So she wrote all these things in excellent law reviews, but you know the movement went spiraling on and on, and uh, more and more people actually now believe that they can't get closure without making a victim impact statement at the penalty phase to seek an enhanced sentence. So people can be bamboozled by a movement, and I'm afraid this was academic in origin, and I, I, I think it's very sad that, that well, sometimes the bad academic movement takes off because the public, it feeds something the public wants. But, but I think we all have a responsibility to work against that kind of thing. I know Susan may come up, but I wanna sort of put one other idea on the table to just follow up on Rod's question, which is, of course, Chicago is a site of very powerful, activated abolitionist politics right now, whether it's prison abolition, police abolition, sort of a notion of, of returning to a, a, a position that abolition of slavery or abolition is the only solution that other kinds of reforms are reformist and not transformational. Yeah. And of course also a site of incredibly powerful led primarily by young black and brown people um, notions of restorative justice and transformative justice which make very different kinds of arguments about um, the criminal legal system and what's possible. And so I guess I wonder if that is really, I mean, all around us in this city, very much between the two campuses that we inhabit, um, from the west side to the south side, and on the north side as well, but just like this sort of notion that it's not about, um, that, and those are profoundly based in a refusal of anger not in a refusal of it as an animating, 
maybe it is an example of your transitional anger. It allows for anger, but then channels it into a very different kind of response. Yeah, that's, it, it's such a difficult question. I, I've just finished reading the wonderful new biography of Frederick Douglass, which shows his struggle with that question. Right. Because on the one hand, of course, he thought no compromise with slavery, and he was a committed abolitionist, and rightly. But he had to deal with Lincoln and decide how to deal with Lincoln, who was you know, complicated on that issue. And in the end, Douglass was willing to work with the Republicans and Lincoln uh, toward a better future, uh, even though he certainly didn't like everything they did on that question. Um, I think slavery is one of those things, that abolition is the only right solution. I'm writing a book now on animal rights where I have to constantly ask myself, the question about on what things should we be abolitionist, what things should we be reformist. I think the factory farming industry is abolition, but maybe you know meat eating of humanely raised meat might be more in the reformist camp. So, so it's tricky, and I, I do think that when women in the early stages of the feminist movement took an abolitionist line, you know, we'll be woman-oriented women means that we'll have nothing to do with men. I, I couldn't get into it because I was already married and had a child, and so, but I was called a capitulator and a reformist and so forth. Uh, but you know, that wasn't in the end that productive, partly because what needs reform is the family and the gendering of the family. And if you give up on the family from the get-go, then you sort of can't, can't help in that process. So I guess I think that you know, there was something to be said on both sides there and, and trying to improve the future gradually is where we kind of are today. And it's sticky and it's not happening right in the way that we would want. But to think, of course, you know, just, just in terms of biology, you're not going to be able to have a society consisting of separated women. I mean, first of all, they're not going to get to adopt the children that they would have to adopt if they were going to have children. So anyway, I guess being a reformist, uh, I feel, has been a, a, a choice that I'm not ashamed of mm -hmm. on that issue. Okay, we have a few minutes for questions. Um, yeah, I, I'll turn it on. Um, so a, a lot of these have been uh, covered, parts of them have been covered. So there's, there's two here that I think I can combine. Um, um, oh, there we go. Uh, so this is from a student, but I'm then gonna add to it from somebody who appears not to be a student. Um, is there any place for retributive anger or is it necessary to abandon altogether uh, and that's connected with another question, uh, which, is a sem uh, which says, uh, do you think that retributive justice or anger might have utility in deterring bad behavior? Yeah. For example, if you fear response, you'll be less likely to do something bad, for example, nuclear weapons. Yeah, I, I think there are some instrumental uses that retributive anger does have, and the main one is the motivational one that King talked about, that if you're just in a state of despair, you're not going to join the movement and maybe you're not ready for hope and transition anger yet, but you might come to the movement because you really want to bash the other people, then you have to learn something when you get there. Uh, and that would be hard, he thought, and it, of course he did this uh, very, very carefully. But it's better than sitting at home in despair. The, another one is that it might wake you up to the, the, the existence of injustice, like I, I find myself wanting to you know, get back at my spouse, and what's that all about? And that might alert me to certain deeper problems in the relationship that I hadn't noticed before, so it could be a kind of wake-up call. But the deterrent one that you ask about, I think sometimes that would be true, that you kind of get people's attention, and they're afraid of an angry response. But I don't think it works very well and not for long. If you think about road rage, yeah, it may be that if people think that this driver is going to you know, respond in an angry way and cut them off and so on, they'll be more cautious around that driver. But it doesn't produce a good community at all. And I mean, it's certainly true that in the gym, when I see certain guys that I think are in a kind of steroidal rage mood, I would uh, refrain from competing for a machine with those guys. But you know, it's not like I think that solved the problem. I think it actually just uh, saves me from unpleasantness but doesn't solve the problem. So um, yeah, that's basically what I think of that. 
Yeah. <laughs> we had a you, nuclear war. Just oh, nuclear war. Well, see, I think <laughs> nuclear war, it's it, it, they, there, uh, I think, to deter. I'm always in favor of deterrence, and I think punishments of various kinds can be used for deterrence. And in the case of nuclear war, I guess what it was the threat of a very terrible punishment that was used as deterrence. Now, I guess it wasn't the anger, because anger would have been likely to get out of control and get, come back to bite you, but it was the, the threat of a punishment. It was a very bad way to do it. I think you should accompany it, at least, and, and let's hope that that did happen. I think it did happen in the latter days of the Soviet Union with a lot of deliberative talking and a lot of thought about how to move forward together. But yeah, deterrence uh, often does have uh, some value. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there are several questions talking about the sort of um, how difficult it is to adopt a transition to anger when it goes against our natural human impulses. I think you've answered some of those, but maybe slightly related to that is one that um, is it possible that the examples of, of uh, transition anger are really, uh, particularly uh, talking about Martin Luther King Jr., um, he really had no choice, no power. He couldn't suggest the defeat of whites in his I Had a Dream speech because um, that wouldn't work. Uh, and, and similarly, um, and this is kind of related, do women have an advantage because historically they haven't had the option to use retributive justice on an individual basis? They have not had the option? Well, in the sense that they tend to be smaller or weaker, I think that's Oh, true. well, you know, I think women are very retributive in many contexts. My examples of divorce, I mean, I think it's often out of weakness and the false belief that you will achieve strength by retributivism that we get so much punitive divorce litigation carried on by women who, who feel they've been betrayed and wronged and so on. So I don't agree that women are less retributive. They may be less physically powerful, but that doesn't mean they can't use the law and so on. Um, but, but anyway, no wait, what was the first part of the question? Um, just about it, going against our natural human oh. impulse and the example that Martin Luther King really yeah. didn't have a choice except to well, be. Well, I think it's true that King was a complicated strategist and that his reasons for rejecting retributivism were both intrinsic and strategic. He knew full well, and actually he did believe that violence in self-defense was perfectly legitimate. He believed that at least in the 50s and, the, and up to late in his life. Um, so I think his reason there for not having self-defense violence was strategic. And yes, he didn't have uh, the power to you know, use violence, but, but he did believe it also as the right way to go to actually solve the nation's problems. Now, my other two examples, if we had more time to talk about them, of Gandhi, of course, had a nation of a billion people behind him who could get rid of the British by a violent revolution, as many colonized nations did, or they could get rid of the British by a nonviolent revolution. He didn't stop all the violence of partition, which has left its scars to the present day and has fueled new violence against Muslims and Christians in India. But insofar as he did inhibit it and, and stopped a violent revolution against the British, it was a tremendous boon to that nation because they got a chance to start, okay, we're gonna make a constitution, and, and they didn't have to deal with the aftermath of a bloody revolution. Now, the most interesting case was Mandela because Mandela found that nonviolence did not work. So he justified the limited use of violence against property and you know, kind of very limited use of violence, but not in a spirit of retributive anger. He was very careful about that. That He said that his 27 years in prison, 22 of which were on Robben Island in these terrible conditions, a lot of that was very helpful to him personally in getting rid of his instincts toward retribution for the wrongs he suffered himself. Uh, and he tried always to discourage the ANC from taking retributive tactics after they won. They could have done a lot in that direction, and of course a lot of people wanted to, and he stopped that because he thought that's not the way you build a nation. Okay, and I think maybe we have time for one more. Um, in your opinion, how does the media contribute to cultural anger and to what degree? <laughs> well, there's media and media, of course, and unfortunately, 
you know, even the fairly responsible media have gotten hooked on a, a, a kind of scapegoating paradigm and um, you can hardly get any news about anything that's not fueled by some kind of scapegoating, either scapegoating of Trump, Trump, Trump all the time, or scapegoating of, uh, by the, the supporters of Trump of minorities on the right. Now, of course, some of that is more supported by the facts than other things, but I think scapegoating itself is, is dangerous. It does not solve the problem. And certainly, if the Democrats are ever to win in the next election, they've got to move beyond scapegoating and have positive proposals for making this country better. And I think they know that, but it's so, um, the media got, have gotten distorted into a kind of, I don't know, echo chamber of scapegoating. And almost all the media are like that, but certainly the internet, the bloggy media, are, are the worst because they, they're just a constant shrill attack. Now, I'm, I'm not on any social media myself, but I happen to have a family, that some of whom are Trump supporters, who feed me every day things that are being said on the social media that they consult. And it, it, it's very dispiriting because you see that all kinds of uh, people are singled out for scapegoating. I mean, Jussie Smollett is now a huge target of the Trumpy right, for, even when they don't have the slightest idea of any, you know, there's no real reason to doubt that what he said happened happened. And I say, but oh, I thought you believed the police. And here's the chief of police saying blah, blah, blah. And they say, oh, no, we don't believe the police in this case. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, it's just the desire to pin blame. And it, it's so in the ascendant on these media. And campuses, I mean, again and again, they're telling me, oh, this is what happens to free speech on campus. And I say, well, actually, I'm on a campus, and I'm going to tell you now what actually happens on my campus. But they don't want to hear that. So I'm glad you have Chemerinsky coming in, and he'll have a lot of good things to say about that. And I could certainly, I, I do think the campus atmosphere it, itself has devolved into too much scapegoating and, and blaming, and we, we, we really need to try to get out of that. So I, I gave part of my Berguin Prize to set up a, a program of lunches, well, it was already going on, but to underwrite this program of lunches where group peop, students, these are law students with opposite points of view politically, would come together with faculty with opposing points of view and spend 90 minutes discussing some controversial issue. And it actually has worked very well in the ones that I've been involved in. So I think we really need to promote listening, rational dialogue, and not demonizing the opposition. And then we need very badly on our campus, certainly what we most need are conservative faculty who can have you know, the ear of the more conservative students. It's very hard to find conservative faculty who will engage in this rational debate because they're usually not interested in going into the academy in the first instance. So in our whole law school of 38 faculty, we have two conservatives and they're in great demand for these lunches because they have to be, always be the other side. <laughs> um, so we, but we still need to do that more and more. I, I taught a course with one of them on public morality and legal conservatism. It was the best teaching experience I ever had because you had people who usually would have just demonized one another but really listening and having a real dialogue. So, so yeah, I think we need to promote that, uh, not just in the media but on campus. Great. I'm not sure we have time. Do we have time for one more question? It's 10 yeah. of. Yes, we do. Yes, go ahead. It's 148. I'm wondering uh, what is your stand on this uh, policy of safe spaces? And do you think they exacerbate and rationalize the fear and anger? Well, you know, it's complicated, I think, because I think we, we, we do know, and I remember this very well, that, that the classroom used to be used in ways that heaped humiliation on women racial minorities, gays and lesbians, and of course they didn't even know about transgender, so they didn't do it yet. So it comes from something real, that we want the classroom to be a place where everyone is treated with respect, and the old you know, term, political correctness, was about that laudable goal, that the classroom would be a place of respect. But I don't think 
that that means the classroom should be a place where you're not discussing ideas that make you feel uncomfortable. So the faculty is in charge of, that, of making that space respectful. And boy, when I teach some of these issues, like you know, teaching the whole question of same-sex marriage, uh, along with a lot of religious conservative students who are in our law school, uh, because we do tend to attract a lot of religious conservative students, um, you have to make sure that you set a certain tone, like how do we talk to one another? But then, these uncomfortable issues, it's very important to discuss them. Because for one thing, then they see that they can't so easily demonize their fellow students and think that gay students are just monsters that are unfamiliar and unrecognizable as human. And, and the students who, who are gay and lesbian don't usually come out to the religious conservative students because they're scared of them. So you have to produce, I think, that humanizing confrontation, but you have to do it in a way that doesn't say, in this class, you're never going to hear an idea that you don't like. Ideas are one thing, and, and treatment of individuals are, are quite another, I think. Uh, Dr. Nussbaum has to go back to teach a class. Yeah, I teach. So yes. we're going to let her go. Please join me in thanking her and Jennifer Breyer and Rod Ferguson.